Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is recording, I think. Good. Okay, yes, it's, so, yeah. it's my great pleasure to announce today's speaker, um, Peng Gao from um, Beihang University. So he is um, chair of the mathematics department at Beihang University in Beijing. Um, he is working in analytic number theory, like me. <laughs> and um, uh, yes. he, he did his PhD in the US at uh, Michigan University under the supervision of um, Professor Montgomery and Professor Saundarajan. Um, today, he will talk about bounds for moments of central values of families of Dirichlet L functions. Okay. Please. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, it's really my pleasure to give a uh, talk at our IKM uh, very, um, and I thank the organizers, especially uh, Stefan, for the invitation. So uh, today I'll talk about my recent work on the bounds for moments of central values of families of Dirichlet L functions. Uh, Okay, uh, it works. Okay, so I'll presume that uh, our audience uh, knows uh, uh, what an L function is. So let's just say, uh, I'll just begin by saying that at the moment of L functions are of great interest in many arithmetic applications. For example, uh, a, cl a classical case is the 2K moment of the Riemann zeta function, zeta s on the critical line. So this, I mean that uh, let's consider the, the modulus of zeta one half plus, plus i t to the two k power integrated from some capital T to two, two t. And let's denote this by m k t. And this moment can be applied to study the maximum size of the Riemann zeta function as well as to the study on primes in short intervals via the zero density estimates. So they are extremely useful in many arithmetic applications. And in the year 2000, Keating and Snaith made a conjecture that says asymptotically MKT is about some constant CK times T times log T to the K squared for all real non-negative K. And they made this conjecture by drawing connections with the random matrix theory. And the same conjecture formulas were actually obtained by Giacuno, Goldfield, and Hofstein in the year 2003 using multiple Dirichlet series. In 2005, Conway, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith made more precise asymptotic formulas concerning MKT by supplying lower order terms. And they made these conjectures by using the L functions ratio conjecture. So, just now I talked about all the conjectured asymptotic formulas concerning MKT. And actually, what we know these days about these asymptotic formulas are very restricted. So the case K equals to zero is trivial. And the case of K equals to one is ob was obtained by Hardy and Littlewood in 1916 and the case K equals to two was worked out by Inham in 1926. So these are pretty much the only asymptotic formulas that were obtained these nowadays concerning MKT. And besides this, there are some progress made by establishing sharp lower and upper bounds for MKT. And this actually goes back to 
Ramachandra in 1978, who proved or uh, who established sharp lower bounds for MKT for all positive real numbers K. And he obtained this result by assuming the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. And from now on, I'll refer to the Riemann hypothesis as RH. And then in 1980, Ramachandra also proved without assuming RH uh, or established sharp lower bounds for MKT for all positive integers, 2K. Uh, and later in 1981, Hithran obtained sharp lower bounds for MKT for all positive rational numbers, K. And in combining to this, sharp upper bounds for MKT of the conjecture order of magnitude were obtained unconditionally for K equals to one half and also for zero less than k less than two under Rh by Ramachandra in 1980. And this range of val validity of the upper bounds were extended to k equals to one lower n for positive integers n unconditionally. And for all k being bigger than zero and less than or equal to two under Rh by Hebron in 1981. And then we're further extended to k being bigger than zero and less than two plus two over 11 by Rasville under RH in 2012 and to k equals to one over one, one plus one over n for positive integers n by Bedding, Chandy and Rasville in 2017. So in recent years, there are many methods built for obtaining sharper bounds concerning these moments of L functions. And in the year 2005, Rudnick and Sandrarajan developed a simple and powerful method towards establishing sharp lower bounds for moments of families of L functions. And this method was extended by Rasville and Sandrarajan to obtain the desired lower bounds for MKT for any real number k bigger than one unconditionally in 2013. And in 2009, Sandrarajan introduced a method that allows one to essentially derive sharp upper bounds for moments of families of L functions under the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And I'll refer to this as GRH and a refinement of this method by Harper in 2013 leads to the desired bounds for MKT for all positive K, real numbers K. And more recent years, we have two powerful principles that were developed towards establishing bounds for moments of L functions. And this starts with uh, in the year 2015, when Rasville and Sandrarajan enunciated an upper bounds principle to study moments of families of L functions unconditionally and applied their principle for the family of quadratic twists of elliptic L functions. And this principle was further carried out by Heap, Rasville, and Sandrarajan in 2019 to establish sharp upper bounds for MKT for K lies in between zero and two unconditionally. And last year, a dual principle was developed by Heath and Sandrarajan to establish sharp lower bounds for MKT for all real non-negative K unconditionally. And the above mentioned methods for obtaining sharp upper and lower bounds for MKT can in fact be applied to study more general families of L functions. So in this talk, we'll just focus on moments of families of Dirichlet L functions. 
And once again, I'll talk about a bit history about the moments of quadratic Dirichlet L functions. And in 2000, using random matrix theorem, Keating and Snaith conjectured that for any positive real number K, uh, the sum over where D runs in between zero and X and being restricted over fundamental discriminants of L one half chi D to the Kth power is asymptotically a constant C K times X times log X to the one half of K times K plus one power. Here chi D uh, is the usual connect symbol and C K is are some constants. And more recent years, people are getting more interested in understanding or in studying uh, the L functions attached to chi 8D for some odd positive and square free D. And this is, this is due to some technical reasons in our uh, in our study. So therefore, uh, if the audience uh, is not familiar with this uh, chi L of D, uh, we can just think of this as uh, chi D for D being a fundamental discriminant. So anyway, because of this trend, uh, we are actually pretty interested in studying uh, this L one half of chi L of D to the K power summing over odd, positive, and square free D uh, by letting D runs up to X. And for this family of Dirichlet L functions uh, is a conjecture by Andrich and Keating in 2014 that again, asymptotic is kth moment is about some explicit constant multiplied with X times log X to the one half of k times k plus one power. And besides the above conjectures, once again, by applying the L functions ratios conjecture, Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith built a conjecture in 2005 that tells us more precisely these two moments uh, asymptotic, uh, these are uh, the formulas for these two moments. Uh, for example, uh, if we examine uh, the kth moment of L one half of chi A D, then uh, asymptotically this is this equals to X times uh, a linear polynomial. Uh, uh, li uh, polynomials Q uh, of degree say uh, N times uh, evaluated at log X plus some explicit error term. And in the above, I mentioned, I talked about some of the conjectured formulas for concerning the kth moment of our uh, quadratic Dirichlet L functions. And on the number three side, what we have done so far uh, uh, are some result that I will talk about uh, on this slide. For example, uh, in 1981, uh, Rutland established the first moment, namely when k, uh, the case when k equals to one of this, these families of quadratic, quadratic Dirichlet L functions. And in his result, he obtained an error term about big O of x to the three quarters power plus epsilon. And the error term in Rutila's result was later improved by several mathematicians. For example, uh, Vinogradov, uh, uh, Tuck, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is too long. I don't know how to pronounce this correctly, but so ex uh, excuse me if I don't get it right. So uh, Tuck, uh, in 1981, and also by uh, Goldfield and Hofstein in 1985. And then, for example, uh, the result of Goldfield and Hofstein uh, gives 
an error term of capital O of x to the 19 over 32 plus epsilon. And this, uh, in fact, if one uh, takes a close look at the result, and then we can see that their work implies an error term of big O of x to the one half plus epsilon for a smooth version, which was uh, later obtained by Young using a recursive method in the year 2009. And Alderson and Rubinstein also conjectured in the year 2012 that the error term for the first moment can be big O of x to the one quarter plus some epsilon. And then uh, this is what I can say for the first moment. And then uh, for the second moment, uh, once again, uh, this is established by Rutila in the same paper in 1981, uh, where he obtained uh, the following asymptotic formula. Uh, so we can see that this leading term is as predicted by the conjectures and the error term is not of a power saving, but only have a saving from the log power here. And then uh, in 2000, Sandrarjang uh, obtained a stronger form for the second moment uh, with a power saving error term. Uh, so his result implies that uh, the error can be improved to be a big O of x to the uh, five, six plus an epsilon power. And last year, Sono improved this error term to be a big O of x to the one half plus epsilon power for the smoothest version. And in the same paper of San Rajan in 2000, he also obtained the third moment uh, for this for the family of quadratic Dirich error functions. So in his result, uh, he obtained an error term of a big O of x to the 11 over 12 plus an epsilon power. And this was further improved uh, to be big O of x to 0 0.85, uh, so on plus an epsilon by Dal Kuno, Goldfield, and Hofstein in 2003 using multiple Dirichlet L functions, uh, Dirichlet series. And later in 2013, Yang improved uh, the error term uh, to be a uh, big O of x to the three quarters power plus an epsilon for the smoothest version. And Recently, uh, namely last year, uh, the fourth moment of these families of quadratic Dirichlet L functions were studied by Shen, who obtained an asymptotic formula under the truth of GRH. And the error term has only a saving on the log power term. And no moments higher than the fourth have been and symptotic evaluated uh, so far, even under the truth of GRH. And despite this, uh, there are some celebrated results on upper or lower bounds of these moments. For example, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the method of Rundik and Samarajan uh, allows them to show in 2006 that uh, we have for every rational number k being greater than or equal to one, we have a sharp lower bound concerning the kth moment of these families of Dirichlet L functions. And in the year 2013, Rasville and Sandrarajan extended the above result for any real number k being bigger than or equal to one. On the other hand, in 2009, Sandrarajan proved under the truth of GRH that we almost have a sharper upper bound concerning the kth moment of the, these families of Dirichlet L functions. So we can see from on the slide that the result of sound implies that uh, we are only one epsilon power from the sharper upper bounds for the kth moment of these families of L functions. 
And later in 2013, uh, Harper was able to remove the epsilon power and hence obtained the sharper upper bound for all k. Uh, once again, uh, this is true under the truth of GRH. All right, so let's move on. And then uh, uh, even though uh, my talk only concerns with uh, uh, the moments of families of Dirichlet L functions, but I want to say that uh, the above approach, uh, namely the approach of sound for obtaining the upper bounds for moments of families of L functions was later used by Sandrajan and Young in 2010 to establish the second moment of quadratic twist of modular L functions under GRH. All right, so now uh, I have talked uh, about much of the history or background concerning the moments of zeta or quadratic Dirichlet L function. So now I'd like to talk about some of the methods that allow us to obtain these sharp bounds for the families of L functions that were interesting. So for example, let's try to consider how to obtain the lower bounds for the kth moment of the families of Dirichlet L functions at the central point. So say the sum over D of L one half of chi A e to the kth power. And to begin with, we can apply the usual trick of our uh, in analytic number theory by dividing the D into dyadic blocks. And therefore, uh, instead of summing D from zero to X, uh, we can restrict the sum over D so that D lies in between X over two and X. And in fact, we can show that uh, we can obtain a lower bound this way, but uh, uh, this is not uh, that important. Okay, so now the key observation is that, or the key idea now is to, uh, to realize that we can actually have an explicit expression for L one half chi, chi A of D, and namely, uh, we have uh, the so-called approximate functional equation, uh, which allows us to write down our one half of chi A of D explicitly into a sum of Dirichlet polynomials, uh, which is given by the sum, a sum of n equals to one to infinite of this Kronecker symbol of A D evaluated at n times one over the square root of n times W of n over the square root of A D. So here, uh, uh, for the audience, uh, we only need to know that W is a very smooth function, which essentially equals to one uh, when X lies in between zero and one, and then it decreases very rapidly when X is being bigger than, it's being greater than or equal to one. So uh, if uh, the audience wants, and we, then we can think of this W as being either one or zero, depending on uh, the value of X. So in, in particular, because of this, uh, we, we can tell from this expression for L one half of chi A D that the expression, namely the sum of by restricting N. So from here, we can see that uh, uh, this W is, is evaluated at N over the square root of A, the square root of A D. So that when N is being less than or equal to the square root of D, uh, this W is roughly being one, and otherwise this W equals to zero or it decreases very rapidly. So therefore, from this expression, we can, we can tell that this L one half of chi of D can be well approximated by this truncated Dirichlet polynomial, namely the sum of this Kronecker symbol AD over N times one over the square root of N by restricting the sum of n to be n being less than or equal to the square root of d. Or if, uh, if we like, uh, we can replace this d by this capital X because uh, as we have seen earlier that we have 
restricted our D to be lying in between X over two and X. So D is about the size of X. So therefore, uh, in our mind, we know that uh, this later sum, namely the sum of N being less than or equal to the square root of capital X of this Kronecker symbol, AD over N times one over the square root of N is a good approximation of our, our function L I chi L of D evaluate at one half. Of course, this is off by some constant, say two or something like that, but it doesn't really matter since we are only interested in obtaining the lower or upper bounds. And in fact, once we understand this, we can be more flexible by choosing or by choosing the length of our sum. So we can even replace this square root of capital X by an even smaller quantity, say little x. And in fact, uh, in the paper of Rudnick and Sandraja, uh, they have taken this little x to be x to some small power, uh, say, say x to the uh, one over 10k power. And like I said earlier, that uh, uh, we, we denote this, uh, this quantity like same uh, the sum of n being less than or equal to uh, little x of this Kronecker con symbol ad over n times one over the square root of n by capital A of ad. And then uh, we know that A of ad gives a better or good uh, approximation for L one half of chi A of d. So it's natural to replace in the expression of L one half of chi AD to the kth power in this expression to replace some of the power of L by A, A of AD. And if we do so, then it's natural to replace every power except, except one power of L by A, A of D. AD. So we can, if we do so, then we end up with a sum which looks like this, and we call this S1. And another way of replacing this kth moment of L function is by replace L completely by A, A of AD. And if we do this, then we end up with this, this second sum, uh, namely the sum over D of A, AD to the kth power, and we we name this by S of two. And in our minds, we expect that both S1 and S2 behave like the kth power uh, or the moments of uh, the kth moment of L, uh, our L function at evaluated at one half. So now the next idea is to compare these quantities, namely this kth moment and also S1 and S2. And we have an easy way to compare them. Uh, namely, we can apply Holder's inequality to see that, uh, that the kth moment that we are interested in is being bigger than or equal to S1 to the k power over S2 to the k minus one power. And therefore, if we can bound S1 from below and bound S2 from above, then we'll expect to obtain a lower bound uh, estimation for the kth moment of our L function. And this is precisely uh, what Rennick and Sandrangan did in their work. And here, let me point out that bounding S1 and S2 are relatively easy compared to studying the kth moment of our L function directly because these Quantities S1 and S2 are very short Dirichlet polynomials. And in particular, when we are trying to estimate in these quantities, we can ignore all the error terms um, by concentrating only on the main terms. And that makes the estimations much easier to be worked out. And this method is very simple and powerful, but it has one shortcoming uh, because when we are trying to apply Hodder's inequality, 
we need to assume that k is being greater than or equal to one. So hence, in general, this method allows us to obtain all the lower bounds for the kth moment, provided k is being bigger, greater than or equal to one. And the cases when k lies in between zero and one are missing. All right, so this is something I want to say about the lower bounds method. And because of the time, I want to uh, go quickly about uh, an upper bounds method uh, developed by Sandra Arjan in 2009. So his idea is to obtain uh, an upper bound of the, log, uh, the logarithmic of the modulus of L1 half in terms of sums over primes under GRH. So this is uh, what we have on the slides. So this is uh, what's obtained by Sandra Jiang in 2009. So we can see that uh, here we have an upper bound for the logarithmic of the modulus of L1 half in terms of the sum of primes plus some error terms. And then using this upper bound, we are able to control or we are able to establish upper bounds for the number of Dusik characters chi L of D such that the logarithmic of the magnitude of L1 half chi A of D is being greater than or equal to some quantity V plus uh, this, uh, this constant one half log log X. And if we denote uh, this, these numbers by N of VX, then uh, this, this upper bound uh, can be applied to give a control about the size of N VX. And then we can apply the partial summation to rewrite the kth moment uh, of our uh, families of L functions at the central point in terms of an integral using uh, the quantity NVX. And then we carry out this, uh, the estimation using this uh, integration by applying the upper bounds obtained for this NVX, then we are able to de derive an almost sharp upper bounds for the kth moment for our families of L functions. And uh, by, by almost, I mean that uh, this, the result we can obtain is only off by an epsilon power from the uh, predicted uh, upper bounds. All right, so this, uh, so far I have talked about uh, this lower, lower bounds method developed by Rundek and Sandrarjan and also the upper bound method developed by Sandrarjan in 2009. Now let's move on. Uh, let me move on to talk about the more, the, more, the more recent two principles developed by Rasvill and Sandrarjan for the upper bounds and also the lower bounds uh, principle developed by uh, Heath and Sandrarjan. So, I'll begin with the principle developed by Rasville and Sandra Rajan in 2015. And so let's recall that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that they have developed such an principle uh, to study moments of families of L functions unconditionally and applied uh, this principle uh, for the families of, for the family of quadratic twist of elliptic L functions. And then uh, this principle was later carried out by Heap, Rasville, and Sandra Arjan to, in 2019 uh, to establish sharp upper bounds for MKT for K lies in between zero and two unconditionally. And then uh, Heap and Sandra Arjan uh, in last, uh, last year uh, developed a dual principle uh, to study uh, sharp lower bounds for MKT for all real non-negative K unconditional. And compared, if we compare these two recent upper and lower bounds principle to previous method, then uh, there are some specialties concerning these new principles. For example, uh, these principles uh, allow us to obtain sharp upper and lower bounds for moments of L functions at the central point unconditionally. And if we, Recall the 
For example, the upper bound uh, method developed by Sandra Arjan in 2009, then uh, uh, in order to op obtain the upper bounds, uh, we need to assume the truth of GRH in general. But now uh, with the new principle, uh, we can obtain upper bounds unconditionally. And also, as I mentioned earlier that uh, the lower bounds uh, method developed by Ronick and Sandra Arjan in general can allow us to obtain sharp lower bounds for the kth moment of the families of L functions uh, for K being greater than or equal to one, but it misses the case when K lies in between zero and one. But now uh, the new lower bounds principle uh, or uh, together with the upper bounds principle uh, allow us to study or to obtain the kth moment of these L functions uh, for the range uh, where T uh, where K lies in between zero and one. Okay, good. So now I'll just jump into uh, these, uh, the ideas between these two principles. And um, once again, I'll start with the upper bounds principle. So this upper bounds principle can be thought as an improvement or an alternative uh, approach uh, compared to the uh, to the lower bounds uh, method developed by uh, Rodnick and Sanraja uh, in two thousand five. So here, let's recall that uh, when I talked about uh, the method of Rodnick and Sanraja, I said that. Uh, their idea is to use a short Dirichlet polynomial, namely this a of a d, which equals to the sum of n being less than or equal to little x of the Kronecker symbol of a d over n times one over the square root of n for some small power of x, a little x for x being uh, some small power of x to approximate our L function evaluated at this one half. And so the idea, uh, their idea is to use a truncated or namely a short Dirichlet polynomial or Dirichlet series to approximate L one half. But as we all know, or as the experts uh, know that uh, every function L, uh, uh, essentially every L function has an Euler product. Uh, in particular, for our L function, uh, our function has an Euler product, which can be written as the product over all the primes P of one minus chi A D P over the square root of P to the negative one power. So the idea now is to use, instead of using a truncated or use a short Dirichlet series to approximate L one half, we can now use similarly a, trun a truncated Euler product to approximate our L function at, one, at the central point. So therefore, now we can take a truncation of the Euler product uh, so that uh, the product is now restricted to be the prime being less than or equal to some, some quantitative x and we use this product to approximate L one half. And then as in the case of using uh, A of A of B, uh, we can again uh, take a short Dirichlet polynomial to do the approximation. So as we uh, have, as I mentioned that uh, we can think of D as being lying between X over two and capital X so that D is about size X. And then we can uh, take this little x to be uh, this capital X to us to a small power of uh, to a small power, say a power of c for some c being a line between zero and one. So this is this little x is really a small power of x. And then we expect that this this truncated product can be applied to approximate our L function at the central point. So now how do we, well, evaluate this truncated product? Well, uh, we know that uh, we can make this an exponential so that this product becomes ex uh, the exponential evaluate 
evaluated as sum over p of some negative log uh, one minus chi L, L of dp divided by the square root of p. And then we can further take a Taylor ex, uh, expansion for the uh, log of one plus x to see that uh, this truncated product equals to uh, the exponential at the sum over prime of chi of a dp over the square root of p plus uh, this quantity here uh, plus some uh, some uh, error terms which I won't mention it. Okay, so uh, this middle term here on the uh, on the slice, as you can see, that uh, equals to the sum over p of chi of a of the p squared over p, and we know that uh, this chi uh, is a quadratic Dirichlet character. So essentially, chi a of the uh, p squared equals to one. For most of the p, so therefore uh, this middle sum uh, is about the sum of one over p, uh, with p being restricted to be not exceeding this x, and then by uh, Merson's formula we know that this equals to roughly log log x, uh, and then uh, since x is uh, being kept uh, fixed, so we can ignore this term by treating this term as a constant. So therefore we can see that what really matters when using this truncated Euler product to approximate our L function at the central point is this first sum here. So therefore we give this first sum a name by, denote, by denoting it by P of D. So that we know that this P of D carries most information about our L function at the central point. And we expect that the expo exponential of P of D gives a good approximation of our L function at the central point. And in general, like what we did, uh, what we did for uh, using the uh, uh, the method of Ronick and Sandrajan to study the kth moment of our L function, we can replace part of the power of L function by this, by the exponential of P of D. So therefore, in general, we expect that these expressions, namely L one half, uh, the modulus of L one half to the K one power times expo exponential of K two of P of D, uh, should provide enough information towards our understanding of the two kth moment of the modulus of L1 half, provided that this K1 plus K2 equals to 2K. And then the next idea is once again, to compare these powers by choosing optimal K1 and K2, All right? So before we proceed further, uh, we know we notice that in order to make these, uh, in order to estimate these expressions, uh, we know uh, we have to make a Taylor expansion for these exponential functions at zero around zero, so that we can write these expo exponential functions as Taylor series. However, we know that uh, if we do this, then the resulting Taylor series would be an infinite series, which is too long for us to evaluate. So our next idea is to approximate this exponential of some quantity alpha times PD by taking a suitably long Taylor expansion to achieve our goal. Because uh, it can be shown that this P of D is quite small uh, in size on average. And in fact, uh, we can show, or one can show that the quantity PD uh, is uh, quite small uh, in size, but I will, uh, because of the time uh, concern, I will not go to the details for this. So anyway, uh, we know that P of D in general is quite small and therefore we can use a long Taylor expansion to a truncated Taylor expansion to give a good approximation for the exponential 
uh, at this uh, functions at evaluated at this PDE. Okay, and for this reason, uh, let's de let's define a polynomial E L X to be the first L plus one term of the Taylor expansion of E X P X around zero. So this E L X is just a fancy name for the first L plus one terms of the Taylor or Macarin or Macarin expansion of our ex exponential function. And uh, our idea, like I said, is to use this, uh, these polynomials to approximate EX. And we notice that uh, we only get a good approximation uh, when X is not very big. For example, when the modulus of X is not exceeding L over 10. Well, so once we understand this, so we're happy because we know that the entire idea now becomes to use EL alpha PD to approximate exponential of alpha PD. But can we directly use this for various alpha, let's say? Well, the answer is uh, not quite yes. So let's just say no. And the reason is, uh, even though uh, this PD on, on average is quite small, but sometimes uh, it can get as large as say log log D. And uh, since uh, D is about size X, and then this log log D is about log log X. So if we, we use an EL X to approximate our exponential function here, then this L has to be taking about the same size. So therefore, the uh, resulting Dirichlet series or Dirichlet polynomial that we use, namely this EL, can have lengths up to x to the little x to the l's power, which is about capital X to some uh, constant of log like x power, which is too long for us to evaluate. And in particular, if we say uh, we just want to use one truncated Taylor polynomial to approximate our expon exponential function, then we'll quickly obtain the following upper bound for our Dirichlet L functions, the kth moment for our Dirichlet L function. Namely, uh, there is an epsilon, uh, extra epsilon power uh, in the powers of log x. So uh, we can see this is about the same, uh, same uh, level about the result of Sangharajan uh, in 2009 concerning MKT. Namely, uh, if we only uh, we directly use EL to approximate the, ex the exponential function, then we won't be able to obtain the optimal upper bounds, but um, we're going to uh, obtain an upper bound which is off by an atom power. Okay, so here comes a subtle, subtle resolution. So in order to resolve this, uh, we can apply this method uh, by Harper, uh, namely uh, we're going to further divide this PD into sums of primes of different ranges, and then approximate each corresponding exponential by tailoring a suitable Taylor polynomial. And then this is based on the observation that larger values of primes should contribute significantly less to the value of P of B. So for this reason, uh, we are going to divide our PD Remember, PD is uh, somewhere here. Okay, so it's sum of uh, P less than B less than or equal to little x of this quantity chi eight dp divided by square root of P. So we're going to divide this PD into, say, different ranges. So a sum of R uh, quantities, uh, say, PJD. And PJD is uh, this the same quantity except by rest restricting our primes into some PJ. So here, uh, in general, PJ is uh, the set of primes that lie in the this interval. So I won't uh, go to the details. And then anyway, uh, the choice for this LIs. So this interval is uh, given by uh, x to the LJ minus one. Uh, squared, uh, one over Lj minus one squared to x to the 
uh, one over LJ squared power. And this, the choices for the LJs are in fact, little subtle. So uh, because of this, I won't, uh, I won't uh, tell our audience uh, how they are uh, chosen. So let me just say that this LJ is, uh, this set of LJ is a decreasing sequence of even natural numbers. And uh, I, I only say that uh, the reason we want, we want to take this LJ to be an even number uh, is to ensure that the corresponding uh, Taylor polynomial is always non-negative for all real numbers X. Okay, so now, uh, like I said, uh, our idea is to divide PD into different ranges. And in different, in each range, for example, for each PJD, we're gonna use a corresponding Taylor polynomial, uh, namely this ELJ alpha PJD to approximate uh, the corresponding exponential function. And uh, for convenience, we denote this uh, ELJ by uh, NJD alpha, right? Uh, so therefore, uh, this, these NJs are Taylor uh, polynomials that we use to approximate our exp corresponding exponential functions. And if we multiply these NJs together, uh, we denote this by uh, ND alpha. And then we know that uh, uh, this ND alpha can be regarded as an approximation to the exponential function of our or original uh, quantity here. Okay, good. So this is essentially uh, our appro approach behind the upper bounds for the moments of Dirichlet L functions. Uh, and then uh, before we move on, uh, uh, there are some slight uh, technical treatment for that. Uh, for example, uh, instead of summing over D directly, we can multiply this kth moment uh, by, um, by a smooth function, uh, phi here. So uh, because of uh, the time, I won't go to the details anyway. So instead of only summing over the kth moment, uh, we can multiply the kth moment of our L function by a smooth function. And also for quadratic Dirichlet L functions, there are some simple uh, treatments that allows us to get a better hold uh, compared to other L functions. Uh, for example, uh, what I did in, uh, in my uh, result is that uh, I made the following simple observation that the, these Taylor uh, polynomials that we use to approximate our expo exponential functions uh, satisfies that if you multiply ELX, ELX and EL negative X, then the multiplication, this product is always being greater than or equal to one. And this is a, this leads to a very nice result that uh, the corresponding ND alpha times the corresponding ND negative alpha is always uh, being greater than or equal to one. All right, so now uh, in practice, uh, what we did is uh, we start with, uh, for example, suppose we are interested in the two kth moment, suppose we are interested in obtaining an upper bound for the two kth moment, of our uh, Dirichlet L function. Then we can insert, because of this uh, property that ND, uh, time, ND alpha times ND negative alpha is being greater than or equal to one. So we can insert this product here uh, and obtain an upper bound for the corresponding two k moment. And this is ensured by uh, this nice observation here. So the first step is to uh, multiply uh, to Get, to get an upper bound by inserting the product of some ends. And then the next trick is uh, a neural trick. Namely, uh, we can apply Hodder's inequality uh, to the right side of this inequality uh, to conclude that uh, the two kth moment of our L function uh, is being less than the product of these two sums. So uh, the, uh, the property uh, concerning these two sums is that uh, if you add this two to this two k, two times k minus one, then you get two k. And also if you multiply two times one minus k to k over one minus k, once again, the answer is two k. So that uh, 
when we are trying to apply Hodder's inequality, uh, uh, the sum of these uh, this, uh, this quantities all add up to 2K. And if you, uh, if you try some other combinations, then you won't get it work to work. So it's, it's crucial that uh, the sum of these uh, this corresponding exponentials all add up to 2K. And then therefore, uh, in order to obtain an upper bound for the 2K moment, it suffices to obtain upper bounds for the two sums on the right-hand side of our inequality, namely uh, these two upper bounds. So I still have a few minutes, so please allow me to move on to our lower bounds. So before I want to talk about uh, how to obtain these two upper bounds, uh, I'll uh, talk quickly how to obtain the uh, lower bound. Once again, uh, we can first uh, consider a smoothed version of the lower bound, namely uh, in order to obtain uh, the lower bound for the 2kth moment, uh, we can once again uh, consider uh, this 2kth moment uh, multiplied by a smooth function phi here. And uh, the k being bigger than one half is actually known uh, previously. So we may further assume that k lies in between zero and one half. And then once again, uh, as we have seen earlier that the idea is to replace the 2k power part of that by some exponential of this PD here. So therefore uh, we may assume, uh, we may expect that the K1 power of L1 half times exponential of K2 times P of D will provide enough information towards our understanding of the 2K power of the magnitude of L1 half, provided that K1 plus K2 equals to 2K, All right? So once again, uh, we have seen earlier that uh, the next idea is to replace or to approximate further this exponential function by a corresponding Taylor polynomial. And once again, uh, and furthermore, uh, we need to break this PD, uh, break this up into a sum of uh, several pieces. So therefore, uh, we, instead of using exponential of K2 PD, we want to replace this by a product of NDKJ so that we expect uh, that the K1 power of the magnitude of L1 half times this product uh, gives us a good information about L to the 2kth moment, uh, 2kth power, uh, provided that the sum of K1 together with this uh, other Kj is equals to 2k. And then uh, in practice, uh, what we can do is uh, we can start first uh, bounding, uh, we can start with uh, this L function uh, to the first power um, weighted by this, uh, this smooth function phi and then multiply with this, this, this nd. And then of course, uh, we can the first, as the first step, we can bound this by its magnitude. So we can get an upper bound. And the next thing is that I want to apply Hodder's inequality to the right side of this quantity here uh, by by uh, choose uh, the exponential correctly. So that like uh, I have indicated that uh, the crucial thing is that these exponentials all add up to 2K. So this is very crucial. And therefore in order to do this, uh, we can again uh, use uh, this trick that uh, the product of N at alpha and negative alpha is being greater than or equal to one to balance our choice for the exponentials. And then we can also uh, split uh, the first power of uh, the magnitude of L by uh, to be the product of the uh, seed power, seed power of this uh, magnitude times one minus six power. And then we can insert some powers uh, here. Okay, uh, this one with this one, and because the product is being greater than or equal to one, so can, we can only get an upper bound. And then we can, choose a proper C and apply Hodder's inequality. So I'll skip all the details. But anyway, uh, by choosing this C uh, to be this number here, uh, we can see that all these, uh, these exponentials 
add up to 2k. For example, you can check, check that 2 times plus 2k minus 2 equals to precise 2k. And also the first exponential is 2k. So therefore, uh, by doing this, uh, we can uh, obtain something like this. So combine this, uh, so I'll skip this. So I'll combine this uh, with, so we started with this and we know this is going to be less than or equal to the product of three quantities here. And so uh, in order to obtain a lower bound, uh, we can see that uh, it suffices to show if we can bound this and these quantities from above and this quantity from below, and then we are going to obtain a lower bound for the 2k at the moment uh, of the uh, magnitude of our L function at the central point. And so therefore, uh, in summary, uh, we, all we need to do is to estimate uh, these two quantities from below. And then, uh, so uh, uh, we can do that. So before I end my talk, uh, I'll just uh, present you uh, the theorem that I obtained. So what I uh, obtained uh, in my work is to show that unconditionally, uh, for any k being greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to two, the kth moment of the magnitude of L one half of k L of d uh, is about the size of x times log x to the k times k plus one over two power. So this is the size is precisely what's predicted uh, by the previous conjectures. So this is my result. And then I'll, uh, sorry, I, just go over time, but I'll quickly talk about the, uh, the, uh, the method. Okay, so uh, as we have seen that, uh, we need to, for the lower bounds, we need to uh, estimate these two quantities from below. And for the upper bounds, uh, we need to estimate uh, these two quantities from above. So by putting them together, uh, we are, all we need to do is to estimate these four quantities that uh, we have, uh, you, you have seen on the slide uh, from either below or the above, All right? Uh, so uh, fortunately uh, we have uh, good tools for us to estimate these quantities. Uh, they are basically due to uh, some larger. Uh, for example, all we need to know is to, uh, to know the, uh, uh, the twisted first moment, which is due to some larger. Uh, so here's uh, this result. And also we need to know a twisted second moment, which is again due to uh, Sandraja. But combine these two uh, results and also um, into the evaluation of these four quantities, uh, then we can further notice that we may restrict our attention uh, to the main terms because uh, these, uh, these ends uh, they are polynomials and they are very short so that uh, the error term essentially contribute nothing can be quickly ignored. And by doing this, uh, we are able to obtain uh, our result. So uh, I think time, I just running over time. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so I'll stop here and thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So we usually applaud. <laughs> The speaker. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, are there questions from the audience? Hello, sir. Yeah, please ask your question. Anubata? Mm. Yes, sir. Sir, you told that uh, in the computation of x to the power log log x, this is a very much a computational thing, but we know that log log n, and this is approximately equivalent to three. So what is the drawback uh, of the... Uh, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, can you speak a little louder or maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, can I, uh, somehow it's, uh, I can't hear that very, uh, okay, I made my audio very loud, can you? Uh, can you please uh, say this again? Uh, I, I don't get the question. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. 
Uh, Anubrata, please try to speak loudly. Or maybe just my, um, yeah. Or, or, or you can just type or whatever. Yes, yeah, sorry uh, for that. Okay. Uh, somehow yeah. I don't. Uh, That's hello? a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. I am can, I audible? I yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, okay. So, so in the in the expression of 2K moment, you told that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there is some expression like x to the power log log x uh, and this is very much computational because of the this power log log x time but we know that uh, log you... log n this uh, so are you referring to this one here yes 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 but yes oh, okay. but we know that uh, but we know that log log n this is approximately equivalent to three so why this is too much uh, long to calculate uh uh this is uh because uh, uh why this is uh, too long uh because this is uh, this exceeds uh the power of so this is much uh, way bigger than uh this uh this x to the log x uh, to the power so this is uh uh this is roughly uh, the same size so that's uh uh so if you use this then uh you won't you won't get rid of this epsilon. So uh, this is, uh, how do I explain to you? Uh, no, sir, my, so if you look, look at this, yeah. So if you look at the size, uh, this is, uh, 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 I, uh, the, the main term is x times log x to the k squared, right? Mm, so yes. it's something like uh, k over k. So, so if, you, if you have this, then, uh, then this, itself will give you about the same uh, the, the main term but then you have to multiply something else and if you do that and that will give you something slightly bigger which is contributes to this uh epsilon power so that's the reason here okay okay i i, I am thinking that we know that uh, log log n this is approximately equivalent to three so mm. we do not need uh, so much uh, uh, Calculation. But you need to think of a very, very large x. Log log yes. x yeah, tends to x infinity. is quite large. Yes. <laughs> so you yes, cannot, uh, yes, yeah. I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there further questions from the audience? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, I, 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 I have one question. Uh, so why do we consider our sum of square free integers in this type of uh, series? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, uh, that's because uh, this will make this chi a of d to be a to be a pretty primitive character, and so that's uh, this L function. We have a functional equation that satisfies very nice properties. And if you take some other d's, and then uh, they will, uh, in general, they are not as nice as this uh, uh, primitive character. Uh, the, the L function uh, attached to uh, primitive fact, uh, characters. So that's the reason. Okay, so thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Are there further questions from the audience? Okay, I have a question. Um, so the previous yes, method, um, so the first method to uh, get um, upper bounds with this epsilon power, extra yes. epsilon power, that depended on yeah. RH, GRH. Yes, yes. And, but uh, so this um, more recent method, which gives sharp and sharp yes. upper bound, um, doesn't depend on yes. RH. So how yes. uh, to get yes. rid of RH? Uh, how do, uh, that's because this upper bounds, uh, uh, yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the thing is, uh, okay, I, I didn't in include it here. Uh, I, I did it for my L function, but what we did is you, so remember uh, we have to apply Holders inequality, right? So, uh, so uh, okay, good. Uh, so maybe I'll get back to uh, to the on this this slide. So the thing is, uh, how do we get? Uh, so roughly speaking, how do we get off this R, R and GRH? Is because we have converted uh, the estimation of L upper bound for L to the k power to an upper bound for L one half to the, for example second power times a short polynomial, a Dushi polynomial, 
but this can be evaluated without assuming GRH. That's the point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why this is conditional because you can only get, so, so the idea is depends on what you can do for the powers of L functions. So suppose, for example, if we can evaluate the fourth power of L function twisted by a Dirichlet polynomial, then we'll enlarge the unconditional result for this K. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, I don't know whether I've, so when you apply the uh, Holder's inequality, the kth moment is, uh, uh, is bounded above by a product of some short polynomials, <coughs> which looks like the third one here, which is no big deal because uh, they're very short and you can easily evaluate them. Uh, but the crucial thing is, uh, then it's a bounded bar by, okay, so maybe here, uh, Steph, I'll show you this. Uh, so uh, now you can see here. Okay, so, all right. So this is the, the point. So the 2 kth moment is bounded about by something which is no harm to us because this is a very short duration polynomial. But the crucial thing is, it's bounded about by, for example, if we take uh, two here, then it's the second power, the second moment twisted by a short polynomial. And, but in practice, this can be evaluated without assuming GRH. And therefore, that will bring us the upper bound for the 2 k moment without GRH. Okay. And the method works for, for any power. So if we can evaluate, say, the fourth power, then we'll extend this the range for k. But unfortunately, I believe uh, we can do this for the third power, but maybe not to the fourth power. So we can only have an unconditional result for very small k, and that's the reason. But that's uh, already uh, some result because uh, uh, we don't need to assume in GRH. And that's the reason. I see. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question. You mentioned also um, yes, results about the first moment uh, quite early in yes. your talk. Um, uh, okay. So could you Are you talking back? about the zeta, the zeta function? Yeah, yeah. Zeta function? Oh, okay. MKT, uh, are you? Okay, I'll go back to this. Right. <clears throat> So uh, are, are you talking about uh, which fourth moment? Can you please? Uh, so the, the first moment, um, but this was a uh, oh, oh, oh. L, L function. Oh, oh, so I, think, uh, I, I see, I see. Uh, you mean uh, uh, right, right uh, this one, I understand. Yes, uh, this one, right? This fourth moment? Uh, no, not, not about fourth, this? first. A uh, first, okay. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry about that, okay. Uh, are you talking about, the, talking about the first moment for the L function or for the uh, zeta function? Um, I think it was. This is the first yeah, moment. Yeah, this is one. Yeah, okay. I just was. Um, okay. Zeta function. That was zeta function? No, that zeta was. Um, okay. No, no, no. That was. Um, no, that was uh, the quadratic L function, average. Uh, I mean, moment. This uh, the L function or the zeta function? L function. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, L function. Okay, so yeah. this is mm -hmm. my slide for the first. Yeah, time. yeah, yes. yeah. Precisely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. So there occurred this um, conjecture x to the one fourth plus epsilon. Yes. So yes. what? What x. is? Yeah. What is the best possible? Which one? Which one? I mean, is this, uh, are I, omega results? Uh, no, I don't know anything about the Omega results okay. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I believe they probably derived this for, uh, from a random matrix theorem, something like that. But I, I, I do not, I'm not aware about any results concerning the Omega. But, but yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a very interesting thing to talk about, to look, to look into. Yes. So um, this one fourth maybe cannot be uh, expected to be improved. Maybe that's yes, the, the uh, limit of the. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they have a reason that why this should be an x to the y fourth power, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. Uh, good. Um, 
maybe you can something okay i don't want to extend too long but um, maybe you can say oh, something about sorry. um higher uh, um higher characters higher order characters uh, uh, higher characters, uh mm -hmm. yeah, yes uh that's good yeah thanks for bringing this up uh recently i have written a paper with a uh, joint paper with uh li zhao you know uh uh, with Lee uh, that uh, we did uh, upper and lower bound for uh, cubic and uh, quartic Duchenne L functions. Uh, but this method, you know, uh, it's very general and it can be applied to, uh, but the thing is, uh, I do not know how to do this for other higher power uh, Duchenne characters is, uh, except for the six power, because uh, you know, you are the expert for this, you know, because um, for the cubic, quartic, and uh, six uh, sectic uh, Duchenne uh, characters, we have a precise uh, description using uh, the corresponding uh, hacker characters in the corresponding quadrat uh, imaginary quadratic uh, number fields. So that there's essentially a one to one correspondence between cubic, quartic, uh, and sectic uh, characters uh, in terms of these hacker characters. But uh, say, if you ask me, how do we do the conic character, then I don't know how to do it. So that's why uh, essentially that's pretty much what I know concerning these higher powered uh, characters. But there are many other things we can do. For example, you can move on <coughs> to consider cubic hacker characters and those things are very interesting. Uh, so uh, I, I believe uh, 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 there are plenty of uh, plenty of L functions attached to higher powered, higher characters, but not in the sense of Jewish characters. And um, if well, you are willing to move on to hacker characters, then uh, many of these characters, uh, many of these family, uh, many of these L functions uh, can be done uh, for in order, uh, in terms of this uh, sharp upper and lower bounds. I yeah. just didn't have time. If you are interested, we can write, something together you know yeah i just don't yeah i haven't had time to to uh to work on those things you know but i'm 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 pretty sure that they can be done yes of course i'm interested but we all have our yes, time yes. we all have our time yes, we, can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can work on something like that yeah i just yeah. haven't got time to for this yeah yeah uh, because i'm mostly yeah. right now concentrating on the Jewish characters but if you are willing to move on to Hacker characters, then there are a bunch of things that we can work out. Yes, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Na gut, um, are there other questions from the audience? Okay, if this is not the case, I mean, I could go on with questions, but okay, that we can talk about. Yeah, yeah, Personally, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, then, then let's um, thank the speaker again for a very interesting talk. So I enjoyed it very much. Okay, <laughs> so, thanks yeah. uh, the audience for, uh, for, uh, for uh, listening. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank and, you. Thank you. And in fact, we were lucky because um, there was no time constraint by Zoom. So I thought yes, that yes. after 40 yeah. minutes, it's over, but everything worked fine without any. Yeah, yeah. thanks for uh, yeah. setting up this so well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. That makes things easy. Good. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, then uh, see you soon. Yes, see you, see you. Yeah, see you, yeah. see you guys. Yeah, thanks okay. once again for, for, for listening. Yes. Yes, it was a pleasure. And um, yeah, so our next talk will also be analytic number theory about L functions by Jan Steuding next week on Friday. Um, see you all in one week. Good, then I say bye-bye now. Yeah, bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, yes. Bye.